So everybody should be able to see the presentation now. Um, as Morgan mentioned earlier, I have been leading the subgroup in the surveillance working group related to uh, developing this guidance over the past couple of years. Uh, so fortunately, we had the presentation from Denis earlier this morning, which puts this guidance into the context of the development of national cholera plans. And going back to the global roadmap, one of the primary axes is developing targeted prevention strategies in cholera hotspots. The strategy calls on countries and partners to prevent cholera transmission in areas that should be prioritized for multi-sectoral intervention. And this call is what has uh, led us to this idea of, of defining indicators in order to uh, target interventions. So we saw this figure earlier. This is kind of a broad scope of the National Cholera Plan development cycle. And as we discussed earlier, the identification and prioritization of PAMIs, priority areas for multi-sectoral intervention, is one of the, the first steps that occurs in the inception process. So we have uh, today the presentation of a new framework that I'm really excited to discuss with you. And as many of you may remember, there was a previous method for identification of PAMIs that was published by GTFCC in 2019. Uh, this guidance relied on two primary epidemiologic metrics, incidence and persistence. And after seeing the guidance being used in countries for a few years, we saw that there were a few issues. So for example, in order to identify where these PAMIs were located, there was not sufficient information or guidance on how thresholds should be set for these specific metrics. And there was not explicit information on how we should take into account additional contextual factors, uh, such as WASH indicators and other, other emergency type risk factors. And finally, it was also really challenging to think about how this guidance could be uh, applicable to countries that are nearing cholera elimination because there are not going to be a sufficient number of cases to actually prioritize according to incidence and persistence metrics. So over the past couple of years, the subgroup has been working on a number of activities. First, we did a, a comprehensive review of all previous hotspot identification exercises. I believe this occurred in 25 or so countries. Uh, we also drafted an initial framework, and we were able to, fortunate enough to pilot it um, in, in the Democratic Republic of Congo with the help of Dr. Placide. And uh, we finally now have created a package of resources, which includes a guidance document, a tool, and a user guide that we are presenting to you today. So the primary principles that we wanted to think about when designing this update were first creating something that was simple enough to uh, understand and explain the motivations. We also wanted to have something that was generalizable to many different country contexts and country situations. We also wanted to make sure that it was flexible because we know the reality on the ground is that data is different in, in different places and it's going to be hard to to sort of accommodate all of those variabilities. And finally, the goal was for this guidance to inform targeted long-term planning, not just emergency response, not just in the short term, but how can we actually think about identifying priority areas that uh, would be beneficial for a long-term planning of a national cholera plan. So what we have here is a diagram we really wanted to emphasize this idea of having different approaches for different transmission contexts. So uh, if you take a look at the left-hand side first, uh, if we're thinking about countries with high to moderate transmission, we would be identifying priority areas according to the recent cholera situation. And so we have a priority index that's based on both epidemiologic and testing-based indicators. And this is, what we're seeing on the left-hand side is what I'll be talking about today in this morning's presentation. If we take a look at the right-hand side, 
We're now focusing on countries with low to almost no recent transmission where the identification of priority areas would be primarily based on where there's highest risk of reestablishment of cholera transmission. And so therefore we should be thinking about a priority index that's based on vulnerability factors as opposed to epidemiologic and testing indicators. And so this is what we're calling uh, priority areas for interventions for cholera elimination. And this is what we'll be presenting on later this afternoon and this guidance is still in development. So today, this morning, we're going to be talking primarily about uh, this left-hand side, which applies to relatively high to moderate transmission contexts. So when do we use this method? We've talked about how this is one of the first steps in the NCP inception process, but now that there are going to be two potential sets of guidance, how do you know which one to apply? So we have an indicative rule proposed here. The cholera control guidance should be used in countries where cholera outbreaks were reported in more than 5% of the geographic units over the past five years. And you know, this is something that we developed based on looking at historical data, but this is just an indicative rule and um, it may be, need to be adapted on a case by case basis. So there are three general steps in the identification of PAMIs for cholera control. So the first one is the preparation of data sets. If you take a look at the, the, doc, the guidance document, there are actually three steps. So we'll be following that uh, here on this slide. So first we need to think about the specific geographic scale of analysis. So what I mean here is the operational level at which interventions might uh, be planned for a given country. It could be at the district level, it could be smaller, but it, it really depends sort of on the organizational structure within the country and, and government. We also need to think about the uh, analysis period. How long, how, uh, for how long do we have historical data available? And for how long do we think that this single context is applicable for coming years? And then we also have the next step of, of gathering the necessary data, which uh, we'll skip over here, but as we all know, is quite an in-depth and lengthy process. The next general step is the priority index scoring. So here we'll be using the data that was collected to calculate epidemiologic and test positivity indicators. I'll go into more detail about that, but we'll summarize those indicator scores into a multi-dimensional priority index. So there will be one value, one priority index value per geographic unit at the end of this step. The third step, which I think is extremely important is the stakeholder validation step. So once all of the data has been examined, now we need to build consensus among stakeholders that are going to be involved in the uh, intervention planning and mobilization process to make sure that everyone agrees that the PAMIs that have been identified are, um, are a reasonable selection. And at the end of the stakeholder validation process, there will be a final list of PAMIs, which might be slightly modified from what is initially identified just through the priority index scoring. So let's go into detail. The first step, the preparation of data sets, we talked about defining the administrative level of the NCP operational unit or the geographic scale. Defining the analysis period, we'll be recommending roughly five to 15 years of historical data. And then it's the preparation of data sets. So here we need to be collecting cholera surveillance data in every single uh, operational unit as well as testing data for calculation of this priority index. There's also an optional step, which I'll be discussing later, which is related to the assessment of vulner vulnerability factors. And that comes into play towards the stakeholder validation step of the process. Finally, we have a data quality check. And this, is very apparent, uh, this was very apparent as a need 
from the previous round of guidance because there would be countries that had a lot of data but missing data in certain areas or for certain time periods. Our new and revised guidance has specific uh, instructions on how to deal with some of this missingness in data. So uh, the kinds of data that are required for the priority index calculation, we have administrative data. So obviously we need to know the names and places of all of the different geographic units that will be considered within the PAMI analysis. We need to know population estimates. And then in terms of the surveillance data, we need to, to know about the number of reported cholera cases, both suspected and tested positive, as well as the number of reported cholera deaths. And then in terms of testing indicators, uh, in the ideal situation, we could have the number of reported suspected cholera cases tested, uh, regardless of testing method, as well as the number of, of suspected cases that are tested positive. So now that we've collected all of this data, we're no, now moving to the priority index scoring. And here in this step, we'll be assessing how to uh, address missingness within the indicators and within, uh, within the data. We'll be scoring epidemiologic and test positivity indicators, and finally combining those indicator scores into a single priority index. So the three epidemiologic indicators that we have are incidence, the, the cumulative incidence rate per population during the analysis period. Uh, this is quite similar to the initial indicator from the 2019 guidance. We've now added a new dimension related to mortality, the mortality rate per population. The reason for this addition is that one of the primary goals of the roadmap to end cholera is reducing cholera mortality. So we felt that it was important to include a mortality-based indicator in this prioritization score. And then finally, we have persistence, which is, again, the same indicator we had before. This is a term we sort of made up, but what it really means is the percentage of weeks with at least one reported suspected cholera case. So how long, how much time throughout the year are we seeing cholera appear in this location? And the scoring we tried to keep as simple as possible. There wasn't any previous guidance on how to do this in the past. So uh, now we have uh, scoring based on quantiles. So for each of these epidemiologic indicators, your indicator score will have zero points if there are no cases or no deaths throughout the entire analysis period, you'll get one point if uh, your, your geographic unit falls between zero and the median of, of the distribution, two points between the median and 80th percentile, and three points if you're greater than the 80th percentile of the distribution. And we developed these cutoffs by looking at data from various countries to try and understand what might be reasonable to propose. One thing to note is that the median and 80th percentiles are calculated among geographic units with at least one cholera case. So you won't be having some sort of overlap in the zero point score uh, data. So the scoring is the same for these three indicators. Now let's talk a little bit about testing. I think, uh, Perhaps many countries might be nervous when they hear that testing is now uh, an official part of the PAMI guidance. And I think we all recognize that there may be challenges in having some of this data at this specific time. So for example, we know that systematic testing for cholera is not yet a common surveillance practice, certainly not in all geographic units. And in fact, GTFCC has only recently put, put out the public health surveillance guidance, which is recommending specific testing practices. This is a known gap. So we also recognize that you know, having a standardized score across all units uh, might create biases in the priority index if there's missingness in some places or missingness in certain years. And so we tried to incorporate this knowledge of potential bias into what we proposed. 
And so finally, we, we sort of have a two-step process when designing the test positivity indicator. So the first step is to assess the representativeness, the reliability of the cholera testing data that exists within country to then determine which indicator should be used for test positivity. And we have two proposals of test positivity indicator. So what I, what I have here is a diagram which describes the how we could assess representativeness or reliability of the testing indicator. So first we would start out by calculating the weekly testing coverage. So for what percentage of weeks with reported suspected cases, did we have at least one suspected cholera case tested? If greater than 50% of weeks in at least 80% of the geographic units have some at least one suspected case tested, then we're following this left-hand side of the diagram, and we say that this is an acceptable level of representativeness, and you can use the highest quality test positivity indicator. And so here we would be calculating positivity rate. If, uh, um, if you are not meeting that criteria, so you have either less than 50% of weeks reporting um, cases that are actually testing the cases, or you have fewer than 80% of geographic units that are meeting that criteria, then you're now in this right-hand side of the di diagram. There are two options. So we have a, a, a secondary indicator for suboptimal sub representativeness. If you're still doing some testing, in at least 80% of geographic units. So if there's some sort of testing occurring within 80% of geographic units, you can fall in this middle column where you would use a modified indicator, which is the number of years with cases tested positive. If the surveillance is not meeting this criteria, then we believe that uh, testing is insufficient, and so it would not be appropriate to include cholera testing as an indicator in the priority index at this time. And we would, of course, recommend that more testing uh, and in ro more robust surveillance is part of the National Cholera Plan for future years. So we have essentially two test positivity indicators depending on whether you're at the acceptable level or at the suboptimal level. For the acceptable level, which we, we think of as the best, highest quality test positivity indicator, we have the positivity rate. And that's the percentage of reported suspected cholera cases that are testing positive. In the suboptimal representativeness, we have a more simplistic indicator which is just the number of years of cases tested with cases tested positive, at least one case testing positive. And so because these are very different kinds of uh, indicators, we also have to have slightly different mechanisms for scoring for these, for these two. So if you have a positivity rate um, of 0%, you have a, a score of zero, but uh, less than 10%, but greater than zero, you'll have a score of one. And then between 10 and 30 and above 30, you have two and three points. So we're basically just looking at the, the actual positivity rate and assigning a score based on that. If you're at the suboptimal level, number of years with cases tested positive is very simple. Zero points for zero years, one point for one year, two points for greater than one year. And it's not possible to have a score of three points if you're at that suboptimal level. And again, the idea here is to minimize bias because we believe that we should be sort of reducing the weight of this test positivity indicator if we don't believe the data are as high quality as perhaps the other indicators in that are contributing to the priority index score. And then finally, as I mentioned before, if, if you're at the insufficient weekly testing coverage level, you will not be including test positivity in your priority index. So I uh, maybe 
was kind of inferring this throughout the presentation, but the priority index is essentially the sum of all of these previous indicator score. So the score that you have for incidence plus mortality plus persistence and the test positivity score if applicable. And so for each geographic unit, you would have potentially an index ranging from zero to 12 if all four indicators are used. Finally, so we have uh, now we have a priority index for every single geographic unit, whether it's from zero to 12 or zero to nine will depend on the situation. But we now go to the stakeholder validation process. And really here we recommend a participative workshop with multi-sectoral stakeholders from the water and sanitation, from vaccines, from the health ministry of health, other partners that might help with implementation, any type of organization or enterprise that could be involved in national cholera control planning in order to facilitate buy-in for the places that will be targeted for interventions. And here during this workshop, we recommend uh, an examination and validation of the data that was collected, an agreement on the priority index threshold value uh, in order to determine which places are our PAMIs, an examination of vulnerability factor data, if that is something that the country has decided to do, and then finally developing consensus on the final list of PAMIs. And one of the outcomes of the stakeholder validation process should be writing a report on the PAMI identification process and the specific methods that were applied. One thing to think in mind, uh, to keep in mind in terms of this priority index threshold. So remember, we have now, let's say, some units that have a score of 12, 11, 10, 9, 8, all the way down. How do we actually know which ones are PAMIs? So we have to first select a threshold value, and everything above the threshold would be considered a PAMI. And have at least some interventions targeted in the NCP. But of course, the selection of this threshold is a balance, right? On one hand, uh, it, there should be feasibility to target all PAMIs with at least one intervention. So you don't want a value that's too low because otherwise there will be too many units that are uh, a, considered PAMIs and it's really not feasible to perform activities in all of those locations. On the other hand, you don't want a value that's um, too high because you won't then have a, a very large public health impact. And we really want to keep in mind what the country's specific national cholera control objective, project, uh, re objectives are. So selecting the priority index value uh, threshold is a kind of a fine balance between that feasibility component and maximizing public health impact. And this is why we believe it's really important to have stakeholder consensus and you know, talking about some of the feasibility issues with a large group of, of representatives. So we have an example here. Uh, on the left-hand column, we have the summary of priority index values from 12 to zero. So this is a country that did have that testing indicator positivity rate. Uh, and then we have, sorry, this pointer. The, the second column is the cumulative number of geographic units. Um, if, you're, if you're thinking about where the, the threshold falls, um, if you look at the priority index value of 10, 20 total units would be considered above the threshold. In the third column, we have the cumulative percentage of the population that's represented um, at that threshold level. And then on the two right-hand columns, the cumulative percentage of cases and deaths that would be covered if you were to consider uh, a threshold level of that value. So if in this example where we were to say that the threshold should be 10, there would be 20 units, 20 geographic areas that are considered PAMIs, which represents 25% of the country's population. And based on the historical analysis period, 
that would cover 81% of reported cases and 47% of deaths. So here we recommend as part of the stakeholder validation process, looking at these metrics, talking about what we believe is an acceptable coverage of uh, cholera burden and trying to select a threshold value based on these types of metrics. I've also uh, um, referred to this assessment of vulnerability factors, and we are calling this an optional step within the PAMIs for cholera control guidance. And this is because we believe that the historical data is the primary thing, the, the historical epidemiologic and testing data as the primary factors which uh, should inform prioritization. But we also know that there are going to be certain areas that have either significant missing data or known surveillance gaps, as well as places that have had, that have had recent OCV campaigns. And all of these things could potentially bias or make challenging the interpretation of the priority index value. And so we need to have some additional contextual information to understand uh, how these places should be prioritized and whether they should be prioritized. We really want to emphasize, though, that any additional PAMIs that are uh, selected from this vulnerability factor step are limited and well documented. So there needs to be um, justification for including them beyond what's already selected from the priority index value. And here we have an indicative list of vulnerability factors. Um, a very similar list was present in the 2019 guidance, and it includes things like high population density, cross-border transmission, high risk and hard to reach populations, um, places that are subject to, to climate and weather emergencies or humanitarian emergencies, as well as WASH specific indicators, which we know are um, high risk for cholera introduction and spread. But uh, as, as, I, as we say here, this is an indicative list and needs to be adapted to the specific country context, as well as the data that can be readily available at this time. So we have here a, a final diagram that summarizes the entire process. So at the top in the green box, we have all NCP operational geographic units have a single priority index value. If the priority index is above the threshold that has been selected during the stakeholder validation, th those locations will be in the initial list of PAMIs. So they're automatically going to be considered PAMIs if they're above the threshold. If the, if the geographic unit is not above the threshold, um, but we believe there could be issues with reliability of the data and there has been an assessment of vulnerability factors. There might be some units that are below the priority index threshold that are still considered PAMIs. And that's what's shown here in this additional PAMIs middle box. And then finally, if you're not above the threshold, you weren't selected for a vulnerability assessment or were not selected from the vulnerability assessment, you're not a PAMI. So there's only two categories, PAMI or not PAMI. This is also a, somewhat an, an improvement from the previous guidance, which had a high, moderate, and low priority co uh, combination, which made it a bit difficult to interpret for planning purposes. So now the initial list of PAMIs and those additional ones are in the final list, and this is what goes through the stakeholder validation. So that's the end of the technical presentation. I wanted to point you all into the direction of the resources that we have publicly available related to this topic. So it, you can all go to this website. Um, the easy link is tinyurl.com slash gtfcc dash PAMIS, P-A-M-I-S. That should direct you to a GTFCC resources page where you'll find a number of tools that are all part of this PAMI for caller control package. 
So the primary thing we have is a guidance document, which goes into more detail um, from what I've described today. In the annex of the guidance document, there is a template report. So that's a starting place where a country might go to, to write up the final report after stakeholder validation. There's also a Excel-based tool, which helps describe uh, what data should be collected and organize it in a way that will help facilitate the uh, calculations. So that includes those, those Excel-based tools include an empty data input template, as well as three training data sets, which you can use as examples to see how you can play around with the tool, to see what format the data should be in, and um, the, the differences between the data sets also show what to do with different missingness levels of data. So it's really a comprehensive way of trying to understand how to use the Excel tool. And it also is accompanied with a very detailed user guide. So I think the guidance document is a lot more high level, whereas the user guide is really for the analyst that might be applying this technique in a specific place. How do you deal? How do you clean the data? How do you think about missingness? How do you step-by-step step use the different uh, pieces of the tool? And we'll be discussing the, the tool and user guide in the session later today, uh, where there will be a hands-on demonstration. So hopefully now you're able to access the website and maybe download the tool so that later on in the afternoon, um, you'll be able to use them ourselves when uh, we have the demonstration. And as I mentioned in the beginning, these are all documents that are in English. We are currently uh, translating everything into French. And if there are other languages that we, we think may be important to include, please let us know and we can figure out how to, to do that as well. Uh, so the, the tool and user guide, if you take a look at today's program, there's the yellow box. Um, there's the hands-on workshop at noon. And um, this is optional, but I, I highly recommend that everybody attend just to get a sense of, of what we've developed here. So in summary, uh, the new recommended method is doing a number of things that differ from the 2019 guidance. First, we're including several additional indicators, both mortality and test positivity. We're providing more detailed and harmonized scoring rules so that uh, this is less of a black box and there's more specific guidance. We also have um, guidance on how to select a country specific threshold. Uh, we're also putting greater emphasis on consensus building among multi-sectoral stakeholders, as this is a really critical step in uh, motivating and, and getting buy-in from, from everybody to, to follow national cholera planning. We also have explicit guidance on the selection of additional PAMIs that is based solely on vulnerability factors. And we finally have this uh, comprehensive package of resources and tools available. So the PAMI identification, as, as we've discussed through the various indicators, this is really relying on having robust surveillance and testing. And so the other sessions that we'll be having um, both tomorrow, Wednesday morning, where we're talking about cholera surveillance at country level, as well as the Thursday morning session where we're talking more about testing and confirmation of cholera, all of these can feed into having a more robust PAMI analysis, in addition to being important for cholera surveillance and, and cholera control. So I think all of these activities really tie in together and improving surveillance and testing is going to help us with prioritization and planning as well. So uh, with that, I'd really like to thank the subgroup members who've been participating in this work for to some of them two and a half years now. It's been a long time. I'd also like to thank the collaboration with our pilot countries. Um, I mentioned uh, Dr. Flacid and our, our piloting of the cholera control guidance with um, DRC. 
And we'll be talking a bit later about our guidance on cholera elimination, which we've piloted in Mali with Dr. Jose Pum. So thank you to everyone who's participated in this work. I'm really proud to have this published and I, I hope that you all get a chance to take a look at it and we can discuss further in the meeting. Thank you everyone. I'm happy to take any questions. I think we have until 1130. So we have a lot of time if there are questions in either English or French, online, in person, anything is possible. So yes. Thank you very much for the presentation, uh, Nada Gosson from Lebanon. I've seen that in the scoring, you have the AP part and you have the scoring part, testing part. So what about the vulnerability uh, part? Because if you have cholera outbreak, this means that your, con your context, your environment is at risk of having cholera. And, uh, and why they are optional? Because in your, in your scoring testing, it's optional to have the scoring about the, the vulnerability factors. So why are they optional and not mandatory? Thank you. Thank you. I think that's a really good question and something we discussed a lot. The reason that we have the epi and testing indicators as the, the primary indicators is because we believe that historical cholera burden is the most important uh, in a predictor of future cholera burden. And so in places with high to moderate transmission, it's likely that there will be too many places that we actually need to, to have some sort of control measures in. And so in order to triage and prioritize the most important ones, we first focus on the epidemiologic and testing indicators and the vulnerability factors are really to supplement places that may not have good quality data that can actually predict and show historical burden. Um, once we get more into the, the second guidance, which focuses on countries with low to no recent transmission, uh, we have a much more detailed description of vulnerability factors because there we can't rely on any case data. There shouldn't be that many cases. Um, and you know that's not to say that countries shouldn't be including vulnerability factors. I think for targeting specific uh, interventions, it might be useful to incorporate more vulnerability factor information. I think we'll be discussing that actually in uh, the, the presentation at 1145, where we talk more about prioritization of OCVs, where there there's more explicit consideration of vulnerability factors. But I think for overall prioritization, uh, focusing on historical burden has been our primary approach for high to moderate transmission locations. Yes. Thank you very much, uh, Ibrahim from Uganda. And thank you for the presentation. Uh, I don't know whether I'm preempting the discussion, but uh, my focus goes on improving diagnostics. Uh, you have not mentioned so much about what we can do to improve the diagnostics uh, in terms of reducing uh, the turnaround time uh, for confirmation of if it is an outbreak. And uh, as well, looking at the other side of genomics. Uh, why am I saying that? We have learned a lot uh, leveraging on the COVID uh, out investments and outcomes that genomics can be done to improve uh, uh, diagnostics and also the transmission and all those other aspects uh, of linking cases and other things. So that's where I'm coming from. Uh, I would request if you could give a highlight if it is in the plan I submit. Thank you. Thank you for the question. Uh, so this guidance is really focusing on where we should be having future caller activities. It's not necessarily about how to perform that implementation. I think the very first step in national cholera planning should be selecting the places that need specific intervention 
selecting places that might need either more robust surveillance, such as genomic sequencing or more diagnostic testing. But this is really focused on looking at the historical data and trying to see where the gaps are in surveillance, as opposed to focusing on how to perform that implementation. That's something that the, the working group is planning to develop guidance on in the future, but we haven't quite gotten there yet. And this is focusing first on how to prioritize areas for intervention. I'll get to more, Mary Laura, I think has a response as well. Okay, thank you. Just wanted to, to say as a compliment that we will discuss uh, diagnostic um, on Thursday. Thursday morning and after we have two days uh, uh, for the laboratory and we will discuss uh, the role of the diagnostics, the different steps and also the role of uh, whole genome sequencing. Okay, so. <laughs> okay, thank you. Uh, okay. Sh sure, sorry, I don't know your name. <laughs> yes. Uh, thank you uh, for presenting the PAMI guideline and identification of the hotspot. The, my question is, the, after uh, following this guideline and identification of the hotspot areas, uh, like um, the like a country like Bangladesh, where the huge population and uh, uh, cholera is endemic country. So we have uh, done this uh, uh, preliminary uh, PAMI uh, for, uh, analysis and PAMI, following the PAMI guidelines. I uh, hope our presentation is next. What would be the next after uh, finding the, the huge uh, number of population that need to be vaccinated or uh, those are the, at high risk or very high risk uh, populations? Thank you. Thanks for the question. So this goes back a little bit to Denise's presentation. Where does the PAMI identification fit in in the entire planning and implementation process? After PAMIs have been identified, there should be discussions about what to do in each specific PAMI. So uh, mobilizing resources across different pillars, seeing which uh, where vaccination should be targeted, where as well as where WASH and other types of intervention should be targeted. So this is really the first step of triaging which locations we need to focus on for doing that uh, system strengthening and selection of, lo of, of specific interventions. I will say that there isn't so much guidance right now on how to do that. And this is something we're very well aware of in terms of the resources that GTFCC is providing. So there is a current development that we'll hear about later today on how OCV should be prioritized once PAMIs have been identified. It's very much a, a related process. Um, but unfortunately, there aren't a lot of resources for the other pillars yet. And this is something that the other working groups are currently developing. I don't know if, if some, do you want to comment on that, Natalie, or anyone wanted to comment on that? Thank you, Elizabeth. We will give the floor to an online participant, and this is uh, Nicole Fouda. Nicole, over to you. Um, hi, everyone. Thank you for the presentation, Dr. Elizabeth. Um, I have a question. Um, what is the recommendation for countries that had used their 2019 uh, tools for identification of hotspots? Anyway, we used it and we updated it to 2023. So do, do you suggest that we we start everything over to identify the premise. Thank you. Thank you for the question. I think this is a really important point. Uh, one thing that we are suggesting in this guidance is the frequency at which this activity should be uh, performed. In the past, I believe the 2019 guidance said this should be done every year. This is not the case anymore. The reason for this is that it's very challenging for any activities to be implemented within a year of PAMIs being identified, right? We are not trying to create a nonstop cycle of just 
doing this PAMI identification and then getting new data and identifying PAMIs again, that's not the goal. The goal is really to inform long-term planning. So I think for countries that have followed the 2019 guidance and it's still within five years of which you've followed that guidance, you should continue with the plan and with those places that have already been identified. I think if it's an, a, a new NCP inception and there hasn't been any pre, you know, recent PAMI identification, then you can go with the 2023 guidance. And now we're recommending that we only do this PAMI update once every cycle for NCP uh, development. So roughly every five years or for however long the plan for that NCP is, you should not do another update until that period has passed. We have a comment in the back. Yeah, uh, thank you so much for the presentation. I must say um, this is really critical to uh, the setup of uh, the design of the NCP and you know having to target specific uh, areas where you know high priority activities can be carried out. I do have uh, an initial question which I think you already answered about the time frame of uh, how frequent the permits should be conducted. Uh, the, the other comment I would say perhaps is uh, uh, we could really look at how to use these permits as a, as a means of really objectively monitoring or tracking the progress countries have made over a long period of time in terms of uh, impact of the interventions carried out. For example, we have the PAMI done this year, and then in five years time, we carry out the same PAMI, identify the, the, the districts, and progressively we sort of observe if the impact of these activities is reflective on the ground in terms of uh, how many districts are now vulnerable, how many districts are going to be targeted as compared to uh, the previous five years. I I think it, it's something worth exploring as well. Yeah. Thanks for the comment. I completely agree. I think that, uh, you know, if we follow the ideal trajectory of, of NCP planning, we have an initial list of PAMIs that are identified in the next round. Hopefully most of those places are no longer PAMIs because interventions have been applied. And there's actually a lower overall distribution of incidents, mortality. And so, you know, we're, we'll be targeting potentially different places in that second round. And eventually you go further and further, and then you, you switch over to the guidance for cholera elimination because you're actually no longer meeting that high to moderate transmission context um, anymore. And so I, I think this, you know, hopefully, with more robust surveillance and more standardized surveillance data that should be collected, we can do a better job of monitoring and evaluation as well. Natalie? Okay, sorry. Um, there has been a question in the chat online from Rachel Godermode, and she thanks you for the presentation, and she's wondering how non-confirmed cholera data, um, for example, acute watery diarrhea outbreaks, are also going to be considered in the tool. Thank you. So um, perhaps this was, was not explicitly clear in the presentation, but the incidence indicator that we have is based on the suspected cholera definition that's provided by the public health surveillance guidance. And the reason for that is even though that's not ideal, we know this is the reality in most countries and suspected cholera is going to be the data that is most likely to be available in all of the geographic units. So we are taking into account suspected cholera um, very heavily in this guidance. Duncan? Um, thanks, Elizabeth. I, I I think I understood that really a lot of this is going to hinge on your geographic unit and the definition of that unit. And I wonder if you could just give us more commentary around that, because that would seem to be pretty critical. Thanks. 
Yeah, so we have this term NCP operational geographic unit, which is very vague, I, I realize. Uh, the reason for that vagueness is because the we, we want to have the flexibility for countries to choose which scale at which they're performing, not just this analysis, but what scale the interventions and planning should be occurring on. So, you know, in some cases, in some countries, it might be at the district level because that's where they have the strongest capacity for planning and operations. Whereas in other countries, it might be admin three level. I know, for example, in Ethiopia, they're doing this at the Oreda admin three level. Many other countries are at the district level. So it really depends on the context. And it's not something that we can say in a single blanket statement, it should always be at this specific administrative level. It's very much about the country context and at what scale they are most you know, capable and um, willing to do planning. And so that is a discussion that perhaps should be consulted with stakeholders before making a single decision. Uh, regarding, thank you, regarding the testing, what kind of test do you consider rapid test? And we know that rapid test is not confirmatory test for cholera, and we have the culture and PCR. So can you specify what tests when you talk about testing testing score? Thank you. Yes, uh, the, test, the testing indicators can use any of the tests that are available. So uh, RDTs, culture, PCR, any tests that can give some uh, presumed positivity of a suspected case. And yes, it's true that there we know there's different sensitivity and specificity of these different diagnostic tests. But at this point, we know that testing is better than not testing. So the basic data that we're using, you know, for most of these other indicators is suspected cases. And so by trying to include all tests, in the test positivity indicator, we're, we're also hoping that this will strengthen the testing surveillance that's performed because it's becoming a more integrated and standardized part of the prioritization process. I think there's been a question in the middle. Yes. Uh, thank you. Can you hear me? Okay. Okay. Thank you, Elizabeth, for this. Uh, brilliant work and uh, and presentation. My question regarding the missing data, how do you deal with the missing data? Because in the tool, you use a historical data for five to 15 uh, years. So if you have some missing data for a couple of months, how do you deal it with it? Um, using zero value, for example, or do you have another methodology like taking an average for this? My second question, you said that it, the tool was piloted in DRC. So maybe it is good to share with us the challenges and lesson learned uh, from this experience. Uh, my third question regarding the uh, testing strategy. You said testing uh, score. You said that any type of testing, RDTs or uh, culture. However, in RDTs, uh, you count probable cases with culture. You count confirmed cases. So how you will uh, gather this to uh, methodology in one indicator. Thank you. So the first question was about missing data and how we handle that. Uh, I, I won't go into all the details, but we have a very specific set of rules depending on the type of missingness that's available. And we actually aren't necessarily recommending imputation of data like you suggested. So not necessarily taking an average, but if um, certain indicators are missing for a year, depending on how much missingness there is, we might suggest not including that year of data or not necessarily including that geographic unit and, and thinking more about that in the third step where we have vulnerability factors. So um, I would recommend taking a closer look at the guidance for the specific you know, there are many different types of missingness, spatial, temporal. And so there, there are a few different things that we've suggested, but essentially the, the rule is about dropping certain pieces of the data in order to limit bias in the priority index score due to missingness. Uh, 
Um, your second question was about lessons learned from the DRC pilot. I don't know if Dr. Placide, you might want to talk about that. I believe we had a presentation about this in the last last meeting, so we didn't have one today. But if you'd like to share any comments, please do. Okay, uh, I want to share some comment, but uh, please can use uh, translation because uh, I will be it will be easy for me to speak in French uh, fluently. But uh, okay, donc uh, parmi le les défis et les la, ce que nous avons eu comme difficulté dans les pilotages de de ces nouveaux outils. Euh, nous, nous notons d'abord que euh, les données de laboratoire, comme a dit Elisabeth, les données de laboratoire sont des données qui, euh, pour le moment, je crois que avec les, la, la difficulté que nous avons en termes de laboratoire de confirmation, euh, on ne peut pas d'emblée, si on n'a pas une très bonne couverture de, de laboratoire, si on n'a pas une très bonne couverture en termes de disponibilité, vous risquez d'exclure certaines zones de santé parce qu'ils n'ont pas pu tester le, le patient parce que pour raison de disponibilité de, de, de tests ou pour des raisons de transport des échantillons, ces zones risquent d'être éliminées parce qu'ils n'ont pas de, 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 de patients, suffisamment de patients. Et comme a dit Elisabeth, la, la politique aussi en termes de tests euh, Ce n'est pas qu'on doit tester tous les patients au risque d'avoir beaucoup de ressources alors qu'ils sont déjà limités. Parmi aussi les, les, les leçons que nous avons apprises dans les cadres de, de, de ces pilotages, c'est qu'il y a cette étape d'atelier qui est une étape capitale parce qu'il faudrait, bien sûr, c'est des modèles, c'est des scores qu'on a utilisés, mais il faut arriver à les contextualiser, tenir compte du contexte local, parce que nous, nous au niveau de, de la RDC, nous, nous connaissons parfois, des, il y a des zones où l'épidémie démarre et c'est après cette zone que les autres zones de santé sont touchées. Et ça fait que euh, si vous considérez seulement en termes de données les zones pour lesquelles qui ont été affectées en deuxième lieu, vous oubliez les zones de, de démarrage de l'épidémie, ça risque d'être un billet parce qu'il faut aller à la source de cette épidémie avant de voir les autres zones peut-être qui ont été impactées sérieusement parce qu'ils n'ont pas l'expérience de gérer les choléra. Donc, nous avons pour la RDC, il y a des zones qui sont endémiques au choléra et qui gèrent au quotidien les cas de choléra. Ils ont une mortalité parfois qui est faible alors que des zones épidémiques qui n'ont pas d'expérience sur le choléra, il suffit que le choléra entre, vous avez une forte mortalité. Donc, c'est des contextes locaux pour lesquels il faut tenir compte. Et je crois que c'est ce que Elisabeth a dit. Après avoir sélectionné les priorités, il faut cet atelier pour arriver à valider et avoir une liste consensuelle de zones de santé de prioritaire. Et ça, c'est une des expériences qu'on a appris ensemble en développant ces outils. Et après, je crois que les interventions devront aussi tenir compte de cette priorité parce que selon les pays, les difficultés en termes de ressources, on, pour la RDC, nous avons 516 zones de santé. Et avec ces, ces nombres-là, vous avez le choléra qui est endémique dans cinq provinces. Et là, ça nous permet, avec cette priorisation, avec cet outil, de nous focaliser sur vraiment les zones qu'on a identifiées, le, les 62 zones qu'on a identifiées comme prioritaires pour la RDC. Et c'est grâce à cette méthodologie que nous avons. Donc, on a beaucoup appris en essayant d'utiliser cet outil. Et voilà. Aujourd'hui, on est heureux d'avoir euh, ces guides, ces orientations à partager avec tout le monde. Merci. Thank you, Dr. Placide.
uh, I think that the some people were not able to access the translation. So I'll try to summarize very briefly, inelegantly <laughs> compared to what he just said. But I think the two main points were that um, there was really challenging issues with the laboratory data, either um, both getting having availability of tests and transporting samples, but also you know, the geographic scale of the testing data that was available. And so we learned about how to improve the test positivity indicators to accommodate those difficulties with the laboratory data. And the second point was, um, second main point was about considering the local context and how that was extremely important for the final selection of PAMIs. And so I think that really informed uh, this stakeholder validation process and making sure to consult with all the important players in country. And I think one other thing I'd like to add to that is that um, Dr. Placid's feedback really helped us with the development of the tool. We were kind of in the process of, of developing this Excel tool and getting feedback from him about um, how to interpret it and, and developing the user guide was really critical for the final set of resources that we're presenting today. So thank you very much for the comments. And I think um, the piloting was really valuable. And I think that the first few countries that follow this guidance may sort of be an informal continuation of the pilot as well, as I'm sure we'll find things that we need to, to additionally clarify. The third question that I think you had was about um, testing and whether we really should be considering all kinds of tests for the test positivity indicator. And I think, as I'll say again, I, I mean, most of the prioritization in the past has been focusing only on suspected cholera cases. So despite the imperfections in test positivity, I think we should be trying to include as much testing and positivity data as we can, even if we know there are differences in sensitivity and specificity. I think one of the issues potentially is that, you know, some samples are now being recommended to get tested with two types of tests, right? In the public health surveillance guidance, there are sometimes recommendations to do RDT, and then among RDT positive, there's culture tests. And so there could potentially be conflicts in that. Um, and in those cases, I think that having at least one positive is considered uh, a positive test in that case. So I think we'll have to see this on a, a more case-by-case -case basis as the guidance is getting used for the first time. But uh, we are very well aware of some of the issues around the testing uh, data, and that's under continued discussion. Yeah. Hello. Yeah. So <clears throat> I was thinking of talking about this in, in, in the laboratory section, but <clears throat> same spot in and to talk here. My voice is bad. Uh, <clears throat> basically, uh, I would like to thank the organizer for allowing us to come and just join this meeting. This is so important to share with our experience. Basically, um, cholera, like the multi-sectoral intervention, multi-method identification would be very you know, important because cholera is a very interesting bacteria and the disease detection is very, very difficult because of the non-culturability or the sensitivity of the organism to, uh, to the culturing methods or whatever detection method you are employing. Like when the cholera starts, like forming an outbreak basically, <clears throat> There are many different, like, you know, kind of supposition that uh, a certain proportion of the infection is caused by non-cholera, maybe parasitic, viral, or maybe other bacterial, you know, pathogens. Uh, in one of my studies, basically, we have basically targeted the 2007 cholera outbreak in Dhaka. So I was really, you know, struggling to culture cholera bacteria from the cholera stool. At best, you can you can have 20 to 25 percent of the infections attributed to cholera bacteria by culturing method. But when I targeted the cholera bacterium by different approaches like PCR, by you know direct first and monoclonal antibody technique, and also by you know the um, 
phage, cholera lytic phage, phages are specific to cholera bacterium and they are unlikely to be present in non-cholera stool. So at the end of the study, we have been able to identify or maybe the infection attributed to cholera was more than 90%, if you believe. Many will not believe it, but you, I refer you to the paper published in 2010, Diagnostic Limitations to Cholera Diagnosis. And this paper is published in the clinical JCM, Journal of Clinical Microbiology. So this is the experience that I have to share with you. And cholera basically um, will continue. And I know after, even after that paper was published, I see many institutions, many, you know, cholera researchers are employing culture or direct, I mean, rapid detection tools or whatever, but not combining all this to come up with the uh, accurate number or near accurate, accurate number, basically. So cholera is always, to me, a very kind of underestimated disease. I mean, whatever figure we have currently is based on the culturing or whatever other rapid detection, detection tool that we are using. Basically, that is not above 20 to 25%. Mm -hmm. Even I can tell you example of 2022 outbreak in Dhaka. So in we have recorded recorded number of record number of cholera patient per per day, which was one thousand close to one thousand five hundred per day for ICD-DRB to handle basically. So this is the largest in the history of cholera basically. So you can imagine the total number of cholera that could be you know attributed to be cholera. So this is, I, I thought this is this would be useful for the audience. Thank you. Thank you for the comment. I think that, yes, there, there are certainly um, a lot of things to discuss in the laboratory working group that I think are related to this issue. Um, I, yeah, I think I'll, I'll shunt that question to the laboratory working group uh, for Friday's discussion, but thank you for the feedback. I think we are uh, over time now, but I know there's one question in the chat that we'd like to, to get to, and then we can go to the next presentation after that. Thank you, Elizabeth. Indeed, we are slightly beyond schedule, but uh, I think there's a comment in the chat that I believe would be important to clarify quickly. One of the points of the presentation was that not all interventions, full package, <laughs> are necessary to be implemented in each PAMI. Does this mean that multisectoral implementation of cholera control activities is out of date? So I think this is an important point to clarify. Uh, what, what we mean by, by that is that PAMI should be, uh, it's, it's not that one specific set of intervention packages is a one size fit all. It's not that you can apply the same set of interventions in every single PAMI and, um, and that, that should be the, the easy way to make the plan. The idea is that once the PAMIs are identified, this is now the set of locations that you should be focusing on figuring out where and how and which types of interventions to implement. So this is a very, very, very initial first triage of places that should be targeted for at least one intervention, but ideally more than one intervention across sectors. Um, but those, uh, those decisions about which intervention should be um, implemented are coming from guidance from other working groups that are focused on those specific pillars. And so we'll be hearing more about the uh, how OCBs will be prioritized based on the PAMI guidance later today. And other working groups are also building on top of that initial PAMI prioritization to, to determine how intervention should be prioritized after that. So I would not say that the multi-sectoral idea is out of date, but we're just trying to clarify that it's not one size fits all. All interventions are going to be the same in each location. 